too much reflection. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 61 of Pixel Feed Radio. And I'm here with my friend, Henry Doss. Henry, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, man. All right. We had a, a little technical difficulty <laughs> right there for a few seconds, but it yeah. happens. <laughs> we, saw, we, we slayed the beast. No yeah. Big deal. Good times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Henry, he's an entrepreneur. He's also a business coach. And this is what I find the most interesting. He's also wrote some uh, screenplays. So I want to yeah. talk to you about that too, man. Living screenplays, um, no doubt. Happy to Yeah, because I love, well, I love copywriting in general when it comes to marketing and, you know, sales funnels and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think even if you're trying to be creative with like writing a, uh, you know, a screenplay or, or a script or whatever it is, or anything for that matter, we all have that feeling when you sit down in front of a blank piece of paper or you have that blank uh, piece in front of you on the screen, you're just like, okay, where do I start? And then the best advice I ever gotten from one of my mentors was just start typing away. Don't even care. Don't you start get to anywhere start. you want. I agree with them a hundred percent. There is no right or wrong. Start at the end if you want. Yes. That's what he told me. And since then I took, that, I took that advice to heart and it's mm -hmm. like helped immensely when it comes to writing stuff for like sales mm -hmm. and ads and all that stuff. But yep. before we get into all that stuff, Henry, why don't you tell us a little bit about your backstory, how you grew up, um, you know, entrepreneurship. I always ask everybody on this, on this uh, yeah. show, how did it start? Were you one of those kids, you know, making money on the side from in school? Uh, yeah, one, of those, one of those like Charles Schwab kid who had the, who had the, the paper route when they were seven years old. And by the time they were 10 had like 26 people working for them. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wasn't that guy, uh, but, but not, not too far off. You know, I was born in Brooklyn. I was raised in the suburbs of New Jersey and, um, you know, my, my parents, especially my mom, uh, born in 27, she was the poster child for depression babies. So if I wanted money, I had to earn it. It was just as simple as that. Right. Um, and so by the time I was 12 years old, I was cutting lawns. I had my first W-2 job when I was 15. I worked at a pancake house for two twenty an hour, which was the minimum wage in 1974. Um, that's what I did. You know, worked to make money any way that I could. Went to college, got a degree in electrical engineering, started working for a big multinational company, worked for New York Stock Exchange. By the time I hit 30, I said, you know what? I, I want to be my own boss. I want to be an entrepreneur. And started a business as a side hustle. And um, 18 months later, turned it into the full-time gig and never looked back. What was, what was the business uh, that, that you started? Uh, I know you're in finance too, obviously. Uh, for those, you guys didn't see it earlier, but you had all this, all this, the screens monitoring the, the stock market, which yes. is, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Uh, so what was the business that, that, that you started at that point? So what happened was um, my, one, my best friend from college worked for a leasing company in New York City. And um, he said to me one day that he was having trouble um, sourcing a bunch of Mac computers. Now, again, this is like 1991. So pre-internet, pre all of that stuff. And I said, well, let me take a crack at it. So I went out on the street in the gray market and I bought a bunch of Macs and I bought a bunch of hard drives and memory and I configured it all together. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I pocket dialed my wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what, what do, you know what, I'll digress for a second. What's the term for for dialing somebody from your from your watch? Because it's not really pocket dialing. It's not. It's like risk dialing. Yeah, and, I was gonna say. I don't think anyone has come up with I that. I don't. Way. I don't have a term because I did it the other day with one of my kids. So anyway. <laughs> you need to call but we, that term. But we digress. I risk dial. I risk dial. <laughs> um, so uh, that was the first deal that I did. I made a couple bucks on it. You know, just going through figuring it out, and after eighteen months, I'd done six hundred thousand dollars worth of business. He just kept feeding me deals, mm -hmm. and I quit my job and started it. And then he, a month later, he quit his job and he became my partner, and we were off to the races. And that's kind of how it started. And then uh, after that, how? Okay, so you kept doing that. How did you get into into finance? Uh, you well, know, I was always. I, I bought my first stock when I was seventeen years old. Um, I come from a family of. Uh, not professional stock traders. My dad was a chemical engineer. My mom was a school teacher, mm -hmm. but they believed, you know, I'm talking about going back to the 1940s. They believe, you know, post-war world, uh, invest in America. So they always bought stocks, always did well. My dad used to sit at the kitchen table with these old value line charts and he would look at, um, you know, the stock movements. 
They put things on dividend reinvestment. They believed in, you know, get rich slow. So that's what I learned. And I just started doing it. And then the first job I had a 401k and it's like, wait, you're going to match. I'm going to put money in and you're going to match it like free money. Yeah. Let, let's do that. I like that. Um, so I started my first retirement account when I was 22, started, you know, putting money away and I run it myself, you know, learned about how to trade stocks. Made it's a, amazing. Made a right. whole bunch of mistakes, did some stupid stuff. Eventually figured it out, and wrote a book about it. So that's really cool. Um, you know, what's funny that you bring the the whole stock thing up because my, my dad, you know, uh, is an entrepreneur mm -hmm. uh, or was, he's pretty much a retired entrepreneur now, but, um, he had a huge company, so he never really dipped into stocks ever actually. Uh, until late, 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 late in life. So I never, I was never around that growing up. But I remember when I was a kid, and I told this on in, in podcasts before, because I've always been a computer kid, always. I mean, we had an Apple II. I was lucky enough to have an Apple II when they first came out in the really? 80s. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I, I got in there, took it apart, put it back together the whole night. And then since I was hooked on, on building my own computers and stuff. So when the whole internet thing became public in 93, 94 with AOL mm -hmm. and. Sure prodigy and all that stuff Good. remember it and, well yeah and then google started becoming popular yahoo web crawlers all that stuff i told my dad i was like you know i was like you need to buy these <laughs> like this is gonna be huge and of course he didn't listen to me and now he regrets it but you know uh i told him about that but what's funny is my best best friend since i moved to the states i met him when i was when i was 13 when i moved to the states he was in my he was the one who was helping me learn english Right. Uh, and he's uh, he he's, he grew up around stocks because of his dad and his family and stuff like that. So he started playing with stocks when we were like 14, 15. He already had his own trading account from his dad. You know, it was under his dad's name, but it was his. And we will go in there and he'll start playing stocks. And I, to me, it didn't grab my attention at the time, but he's huh? a wealth advisor now. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's been doing it since, it's since not, college. It's not, it's not for everyone. It's a little like skiing. You know, the earlier you learn, I learned this game when I was four years old. Uh, earlier you learn, the less terrifying it is. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't learn how to ski when you're an adult. Yeah. But when you're standing there looking over the edge at that at that cliff and you got to go down, uh, it helps to have years under your belt. Absolutely. Because uh, it can be a little bit terrifying. And, and look, there's a million places you can invest your money. Right. I had a chat with, uh, I was in Bangkok at a conference, a young guy. You know, entrepreneur runs a business out in California. He said, "Can I pick your brain?" So I said, "Yeah, let's let's go hang out." We ordered room service, hung out for an hour, and he's like, "What should I invest in?" And I said, "What do you like?" Well, I like real estate. I said, "Then do that." Yeah. Million places. You like Bitcoin? Do Bitcoin, right? You want to do crypto stuff? I don't understand crypto at all, and so I stay away from it. Uh, I could learn it if I really wanted to. Um, but at my age, I got my I got my hands full with all the other stuff that I'm investing. You want to invest in gold? Do that. You want to buy royalty streams? Um, you want to buy um, uh, somebody? I, I run a a, a a mastermind in passive investing. One of the guys brought up um, not cannabis stocks, but uh, psychedelic mushroom stocks. I didn't right. even know That's such a thing exists. Yeah. I'm like, sure, because the analysis <laughs> is pretty much the same. Right. Right. Yeah, but well, like with with my best friend that I'm telling you about, he handles all all of uh you know my quote unquote normal safe stuff like you know the the I don't know the safe investments like oil the, gas the widows whatever. and orphan stuff because there is no such thing as a safe investment. But yeah, you know what I'm saying. That but the, the stuff that I have no idea about, but he's yeah. done well my whole life, so he can sure. do whatever he wants with that. But I'm the ones like, all right, tech. This is what I want you to do. This, 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 and that, and just trust me. Yeah. And sure enough, you know, uh, you know, because that's where I'm in. I'm in tech all day long, and you know, sure. I'm in touch with people in Silicon Valley, and I see what's going on in the social media networks and the advertising platforms. So I have a pretty good, you know, outlook of what's coming and what's not. Like you, you brought up Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I bought up Bitcoin years and years and years ago. Not, not tons where it's like I'm rich or anything like that, but I, I literally yeah. dipped in there. But I don't keep up with it daily. So I'm like you. I'm like, I can't. People ask me all the time, I buy some Bitcoin and the, all the other currencies and stuff. I'm like, dude, I have no idea. I don't keep up with it. I mean, I, I was just lucky that I bought some when I heard of it a long time ago. And that's pretty much it. But I'm not your guy. Now, I know the blockchain technology is going to be worth a lot of yeah, money at some sure. point because you can track everything on a ledger. And that's going to change the game and a lot of things. But as far as the actual currencies and the markets, like, I have no idea, man. That's 
you know as much as I do. You know? there's, <laughs> so, a few, so there's a few guys who are going to get mega mega rich, the Winklevi, whatever it might be. Yeah. And then there's a lot of folks who are going to lose their shirt, and they're never going to dip into it again. Stock market is like that. I was in an options trading group uh, a number of years and and uh, a number of years ago, and we had a uh, you know a chat channel, and three people blew their account up. They didn't yeah. understand how to manage risk, right? They just didn't. They were right. over leveraged. They were um, uh, just not trading with their head, trading with their heart. Uh, no, not going to work. You're going to make mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes. Plenty, plenty, plenty. Well, we all learn from those mistakes, right? Well, you just don't want to keep making the same mistake over and over again. You want to make brand new, fresh faced mistakes. <laughs> really I love wrong. that. <laughs> That's what I said when I raised my kids. I'm not going to make the same mistakes my parents did. I'm going to make all new ones. I don't want <laughs> I don't want their dusty old crappy mistakes. I want brand new mistakes. That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, with the stock market, the other thing with the stock market, um, you know, obviously if somebody's watching this or listening to this I mean, you've never been to New York, uh, you know, especially when you walk by wall street in the morning on a Tuesday or Monday or whatever, it's, it's kind of crazy in there. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the energy like? I've never been inside obviously, but I can just imagine the energy in the trading floor or being in there. I mean, it's changed now. I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I've been on the floor a million times uh, during the trading day after hours, both the Amex and the New York uh, going back to the eighties <clears throat> at that time um there was what's called a specialist so a specialist job was to essentially manage the market so his job he had to weigh two things he had to have a certain amount of cash and a certain amount of stock um that he was making the market and let's say it's apple he's a specialist for apple and he's got to match up the bids and asks and if there are too many sellers and not enough buyers he's now going to dip into his cash to buy to maintain an orderly flow and vice versa so when the crash of 87 came around what happened was there was so much uh, massive selling that once they tried to clear those trades, uh, and it used to take five days to clear, but now it takes three days to clear, which means you have to settle accounts. Um, they didn't have the money to do it. They just they simply were buying so much stock as it was, you know, fast and furious, and and prices were cratering that three days later they didn't have enough cash to settle, so they went out of business. Now it's all done electronically. So right. I haven't been on the floor in probably about 15 years, but the last time I was there, yeah, they're, they're not, it's not like trading places. It's not like people are yelling and screaming, buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. Well, that's what you always see like in the movies and when they like that's show the floor. The movies. And, and, yeah. and I'm like, I'm that's like. A, that's the commodities exchange, which is a little different. Right. Yeah, if you go on the, on the I, I haven't been on, again, I haven't been on the floor of the New York in, in ages, but I guarantee you, it's just probably just a bunch of guys standing around. <laughs> it's just, it's just like yelling and screaming with the phone in their hand and the tickets. Nah, and the even tickets. then there was no real yelling and screaming. Oh man, you it's broke just, my heart. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I burst your balloon. You burst my bubble I on that one. <laughs> bubble on that one. No, now it's all just electronic. You know, it trades yeah. in pennies. It used to trade in eighths. Um, a lot, a lot of stuff has changed, and the markets are open twenty four seven. You know, yeah. all you know, every hour of of the week, there is a market open somewhere if you want to trade. So yeah, but there's something about the financial district too. When you go to New York, you know, if you go to New York and, and you're doing the, you know, you're just walking around or whatever Manhattan, then you hit, you know, when you hit the financial district, oh, yeah. it's like the, the vibe just completely changes. The way people look, like the, you know, the buildings are completely different. It, it's a trip, man. I love New York. I haven't been obviously since this thing started, but I try to go a few times a year. I just, I love New York. I would totally live there if I could. I, I, lived there for, I lived there for 25 <laughs> years. So I lived in the village when my kids were, were little. Um, but now we're actually moving to Connecticut. Um, I live in Jersey now and we're closing on a house next week in Connecticut. We're going to be a hundred miles from New York. It's a, I've never lived more either. I've either lived in New York city or within 25 miles. So it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. That's going to be, I just had my first kid. So I've been living in, in downtown you. areas for 20 years and now it's like, I'm in the suburbs for now, you know, right. because our mom's close and it's just like, take me back, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I go back between Tampa city will always, it'll always be there we have a little apartment on the east side of manhattan and my 24 year old son is happily ensconced there and um yeah it's really cool the city the city will recover eventually 
All right. So before we get into the masterminds and the business coaching and all that stuff, let, let's talk about how you got into the whole uh, screenplay writing. That that really grabs ah. my curiosity. So this the back in the late '90s, like '99. Um, I was actually going through a breakup with my business partner, the one that I had founded that first um, Apple dealership with. Fun. And I'm walking down the street in New York, and they used to have these little um, yellow boxes for um, the learning annex and other places like that where you could just pull this flyer. Again, this is pre-internet. Um, all of those disappeared after 9-11. I mean, you, can barely, you can barely find a regular mailbox in New York City, yeah. unless these yet these yellow they had yellow boxes, red box. They were everywhere though. So I pulled out this thing for a place uh, a flyer for something called Gotham Writers Workshop, and they had a course in screenwriting. I think it was all of like thirty nine dollars. And I said, yeah, I need a creative activity. I used to do a lot of photography, and I'm like, I need something. And I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing, and um and so I did. Met a whole bunch of nice people. Wrote you know started writing a screenplay, and then. I had this other idea for a screenplay and and I abandoned the first one and I wrote the entire thing in in one week. I wrote 96 pages of a screenplay between the classes was on Monday night between the following Tuesday morning and the next Monday I wrote an entire screenplay and I walked into class and it's like how would your writing go I said well I, I put that other one aside but I wrote an entire 96 page screenplay which was the wrong thing to say because everybody started yelling and screaming, oh, you're such an asshole. You're this, that, who does that? <laughs> you know, like a typical, after I said, I realized, oh no, I'm one of those guys, right? That everybody's going to hate. Um, and I wrote it and it was, and I it didn't even realize until many, many years later that it was kind of an allegory for my business breakup. Um but at the time I was 40 years old and people are saying, how are you going to market this? I'm living in New York city with three kids under the age of 10 and I need to start a new business because I'm breaking up with my business partner. And I'm like, I can't go Hollywood. I just, that's just not going to work. I need right. to, I need to start another business. So I put it aside. And then in 2013, I started writing again. I just had, I had a dream and I wrote this script and then I just never stop. So I just keep writing and writing and writing. And the funny thing, we started this conversation. We were talking about you can start anywhere. The very first screenplay I wrote, I started page one at the beginning of the story and I wrote sequentially all the way through to, to page 96. And that's the only time I've ever done that. Every other script I've now written totally nonlinear. I just that, start wherever I think I should start. And that's I, crazy. I, yeah. And I'll write and I'll write and I'll write and I'll usually write about maybe 50 or 60 pages, all non-sequential. Scenes will pop into my head. I don't care where they go. And then at a certain point when I have critical mass, I uh, I then reassemble it and I put little placeholders that, that'll just say like a scene goes here. And I might write a sentence about what that scene is going to be, but I don't write the scene until I feel like writing the scene or until the scene comes to me. Um, and there's there's like you were talking about with copywriting, there's so much to be learned from this because everything that you see, whether it be a 15 second TV commercial to a blog post to every, everything and anything follows a three act structure, right? right? There's a beginning, there's some kind of inciting incident, a whole bunch of crap happens in the second act. And then there's a third act that wraps it up. Every scene within a script is its own little, little three act story. Right. Once you learn that, you can apply it universally to everything. I was going to say, um, I studied a little bit of, uh, you know, screenplay writing or I can't remember the guy's name. I sat through one of his seminars. So that, of course, I'm going Robert McKay, Sid Fields. I mean, there's I think it was Sid Fields. I can't remember the top of my head and, and yeah. I don't want to say the wrong name, but there's, it was there's a bunch of them out there. Sid, yeah. Sid passed away, but McKee is still out there. Yeah. And it was about, you know, how we can use that for webinars to tell your own story sure. when you're trying to sell something. So it's the hero's journey yep. and then, you know, how you break it down, act one, two, and three. And it's basically the way a movie's broken down, but you're using it for a webinar to sell a product or whatever. You're still telling the story behind yourself if it's a personal brand or behind there are, whatever There are brand. seven archetypes. Christopher Booker's book talks about the seven archetypes. Hero's journey being one of them. Rags to riches. Yes, right. there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you watch a webinar, it's always, it's always the same structure. Voyage yeah. and return. 
And there's a book called Save the Cat, Blake Snyder. Uh, Save the Cat. I'm going to write that one yeah. down. Yeah, you should. You should. I've had all three of my kids read Save the Cat. In fact, right. my, my middle son, Michael, the one who's living in the city, who wants to get into the entertainment business, and he just started a podcast. Um, I had him read it, and he came back, and he said, hey, he said, Dad, this is exactly the, the structure of every single movie that I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, ever since I learned that stuff, every time I watch a movie now, it's like ruined for me because I already know how it's going to go. You, you do. Know? It, does, it does ruin it a little bit because it's like, oh, here's the all is lost moment. You know, I call that the, the second act pivot point. Right. There's yeah. Really a point in the middle there where the heroes hit rock bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then he's got to pick he or she's got to pick themselves up by the by their bootstraps. I mean, but this goes back to the ancient Greeks. I mean, storytelling is um, it's an art. <laughs> it, 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 it was our way of, um, of uh, keeping history. Right. Know, years and years and years, decades, millennia. Uh, so it's so important to know. Um, it really is. And the other thing, talking about the movies, there's another thing that ruined for me when it comes to the movies, and that has to do with Apple. I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want to ruin it for everybody else, but it drives me absolutely insane. I just thought about it. Really? With Apple? With now, Apple. Now, now you have me intrigued. Now you got you to let the kill. All right. I'll tell you, but whoever's listening, whoever's watching. Co cover your like, earmuffs. Earmuffs. Yeah, earmuffs. So skip the next 30 seconds. But okay. uh, it's in contracts for Apple that the bad guys can't have an iPhone. So if you see a character in the movie using an iPhone, they're never the bad guy. Really? Yes. That is interesting. Because uh, they don't want to associate the brand with negativity uh, or the bad guy. <laughs> That's it's one of those things is like, really? You took it that far? Like, come on, man. But, you know, Apple's Apple. That's why they have lots of money, right? So there, that's a good, uh, bad guys use Android. That's actually a title for something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bad guys use whatever guys fake use phones Android. or whatever, and the good guys use an iPhone. Or bad there you guys go. use Samsung. Uh, it's crazy. Wow, that's really, really interesting. I like, you know, I think um, uh, phones have ruined movies. You know, a couple of things I've written are period pieces and purposely they predate, they, they, just, they just predate the telephone because all those things that you used to be able to do, like, you know, have a scene where somebody leaves a message on an answering machine. It's like, that doesn't happen anymore. Oh, that's right. I didn't even right? think about that. Uh, I was watching something the other day where um, they kept going to, to, to phone booths. Oh, it was um, Rain Man, right? Yeah. Yeah, Rain yeah. Man. He has to keep, you know, he's calling back about his, you know, cars and not being able to sell his cars. And, uh, and they have to go to a phone booth. You know, the cell phone yeah. just doesn't try. It's just, and you know, the other thing is airbags, right? You see these crash scenes in movie, and I'm like, why did the airbag not deploy? Oh, my God. I didn't even think about that. But yeah. that's oh, so it happens true. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, wait, what are we supposed to believe that there's no airbags anymore? Or is everybody driving a vintage car? Uh, you know, you know what I look – okay, I went to film for one, for film school for one year before I went to, to like, real college. and. Right. One thing that – that's the other one that I cannot get out of my head. It's like when you watch like a crash, like a car wreck or anything like that, mm -hmm. like the first thing that I go looking for is how it's gutted underneath. There's nothing underneath the car because right. obviously for safety reasons. And then I look for the roll cage. So <laughs> depending on the budget, depending on the budget of the movie, you know, if they have the CGI to erase it all out, they will. But most movies don't. So you can see like the whole roll cage in the car. It's just like – I don't know, man. I don't know why I do this to myself instead of just enjoying the movie. But, you know, like uh, I'll be honest. Sometimes I go to the movie and we go to the movie. Well, obviously, I haven't been in the movies forever, but one of my businesses was building home theaters. So um, I just disassembled it. But I have what I call the Franken theater with the 110 inch screen and the projector and all, you know, and, and, and sound and all that stuff. Um, you know, that's that's. Um, that's the experience. I don't understand how people watch a movie on their cell phone. Oh, right. I mean, what I is, don't do that. I mean, only if I'm traveling like on a plane or something. What is that? You know? But I mean, I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> but I enjoy go. Listen, I'm picky about the movies that I go to the movie theater to watch. Like, I have a pretty nice setup at home too, but it's mm -hmm. nothing like 110 or anything like that. But it's a nice, you know, 4K TV, the whole nine yards with a nice sound and all that. But there's certain movies that you have to go to the movie theater to watch. Like, 
Matrix 4 is coming out. I will kill to watch that day one at the movie theater because I'm a huge fan of the first three. Like, I, I'm obsessed with the first three because I'm a computer guy. Okay. So the fourth one's supposed to come out, and I just like, I will love to watch it in the movie theater, but I don't think that's going to happen. But anyway. Um, well, if, so, I'm in a, if I'm in a bad movie, what I do is I'll close my eyes, and I'll watch the dialogue come down, like, on a, on a written page, you know? Because if you've ever seen a script, it's mostly white space. Um, and then I'll think to myself, what were they thinking? Like, like, how many people read this and thought that this was good? <laughs> like, I do that all the time with accounts yeah, when I go to check accounts. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, this somebody could have killed this everywhere along the line. But it, but does does it just does the momentum just take over and say, well, we know it sucks, but we're pot committed to use the poker term, and we're just going to see it through to the end, and we'll see if we can fix it in post production. Yeah, but and it's like know. you can you cannot. My old my my shop teacher, Mister Low, used to say, "You can't make chicken soup out of chicken feathers." Um, <laughs> so you've created this thing and you've spent millions of dollars on it, and you're not going to be able to fix it afterwards. Yeah, but you know how that goes. I mean, you know the studios get in there. And it's like, oh, you need to change this. You need to change that. You need to change this. And then the next yeah, thing course. you know, the original script has been butchered to a million pieces of what it was supposed to be because, you know, they. They want to get in you, there. You, you, what you end up with is is this is a, this is a Christopher Guest uh, reference. You end up with Beach Nuts. There's a movie called The Big Pitch Picture with Kevin Bacon. If uh, all your listeners should watch The Big Picture, it's about probably 25 years old because he's young in this film, and it's a satire and it's one of Christopher Guest's first satire about a film school guy who wins a contest and he wants to make this little film set in a house in New England with the snow. And an hour into the movie, this has now morphed into beach nuts, right? Where it's like <laughs> they're on a beach and it's, uh, everything has changed. Yeah. Everything has changed because Hollywood looked at it and said, no, we want this. So anyway. Doing anything with it or are you just doing it as a hobby at this point? Because I know you got the masterminds in the business. I've, stuff, uh, I've, um, I've entered them into contests. In fact, one of the, there's a contest called the Nickel, which is run by the Oscar people. It's the most prestigious um, contest. So one of my scripts, like two years ago, made the quarterfinals, which is sort of like the top 300 out of maybe 7,500 scripts. That's pretty awesome. And I, and I got a few um, inquiries about it. Uh, my wife knows some highly placed people. She sent it to them. She said, "Yeah, it's great. It's your 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 husband's a terrific writer, but this is not what we do. We buy." pre-packaged stuff at film festivals you know we go to yeah. Sundance and we buy something that's made um so my at, at this late stage of my life i figure um if they're ever going to get made i'm going to be, be the one to do it yeah so maybe one of these days I, I never plan to retire but um maybe at some point in time when i have a little well, the cool thing about it is that nowadays you can get it made yourself and distribute it yourself. Sure. You know, you can run yeah. ads to it. You can put your own website, run ads to it, run traffic to it. People can download it, pay for whatever you want to charge for it. And, you know, eventually if you show, you got the proof, you can always reach out to Netflix or one of those guys and be like, hey, you know, what do you guys yeah, think? One of them I'm going to turn into more of a TV pilot. Um, I've had people approach me about writing, you know, would you be, a, would you like to be attached? Would you consider being attached to this project? I got asked that once in a meeting. I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what does that mean? Is there like a, an umbilical cord? Get the, you know, I felt like a bumpkin, but I don't know the terminology. I, don't, I have no idea what they're talking about. I'm just a babe in the woods. I write stuff. I come up with crazy stories and um, I think they're good. I, I, I look at it through a, um, a producer's lens so I was in a screenwriting class where we were trading scripts back and forth. And the guy sent me the script about what had like a 25 foot alligator in it. And he's saying it's going to be a low budget thing. I'm like, well, I'm no genius, but that's probably $10 million of CGI in order to render this 25 foot alligator. It's actually a pretty good script. And I said, and so my note was maybe you want to change a lot of this to to be from the alligator's point of view. So you don't actually have to render the alligator in these scenes until the very end. Sort of like, a little like Jaws, I guess. You know, um, you know, Bruce the shark has sort of talked around for the first hour of that movie before you actually see him. Again, that, that does make sense. You don't think about that's, that. That's pre-CGI. But if you're looking at it from the perspective of, of a producer, you got to think about what's this going to cost to put together? 
do you have exotic locations? So I, I tend to write my stories um, where there's not a lot of crazy locations. And it's, it's sort of a, if I had to put this together, you know, could I do this film for 2 million bucks? Let's say. Yeah. So it's, that's something that you have to consider. Otherwise, that's the business no side, though. That's, that's the business side, side of you. Well, that's, sure. the, that's the entrepreneur in me. So yeah. this, this kind of plays the straddle. It's a, it's a tug of war between the, the right brain and the left brain, right? The, the right brain wants to write whatever I want to write. And then the left brain is going to look at it and is going to say, yeah, this is great, Henry, but this is a $100 million production and you're nobody. Yeah. You know what? You know, it's funny that we're talking about this because the other day I was looking for someone to watch because I, I don't I don't watch that much TV. I don't have the time. Well, first of all, I have a 15 month old and then two would work. I don't watch anything except sleeping when you can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get sleep. I, I'm, so I'm good. But, you know, between work and everything else, I barely have time to watch TV. And when I watch something, I want to watch something that's really good, not just like trash TV or something. Yeah. So I was asking some of my friends, I'm like, what are you guys watching? You know, I posted it on Facebook and then somebody... Like I noticed that every show, it's like a period piece now. Everything's in the 50s, 60s, like yeah. 80s, like, and, you no, know. No airbags and no cell phones. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, it's funny that uh, that you brought that up. Yeah. But obviously you've, uh, you travel and a lot. And, and a lot of female protagonists. Yeah, like, that too. That too. The last three scripts that I've written all have female protagonists. Why is that? Any particular reason? They're just more interesting. I get, yeah, that is true. Women are interesting. Women are much, I agree with you. Men, that. Women are much more interesting. Men are boring. Who cares about that? <laughs> We're one track minded, man. It's like point A to point B. A woman's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, triple D, you know, whatever. There, there, there's an old saying that um, uh, a woman marries a man hoping he'll change and he never does. That a man marries a woman hoping she'll never change and that's all she does. <laughs> that is so now, now this is coming from someone who's coming up on their 30th year wedding anniversary on, on new year's so um but it's it's true it really is oh yeah i can i can attest to that i've been with uh, my wife well it's 10 years between girlfriend and, and marriage yeah. now and uh she always like i go oh man i'm so tired of being locked up like i'm dying to go on a like sunday fun day day drinking on the beach just go all out you know with, with, with everybody and she's like, like, aren't you tired of that? Like you're 40. I was like, no, <laughs> like, you know, I don't do it like I used to, but in, it's going to hurt the next day, but it's still fun with your friends. Like I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? today, is, today actually is 32 years to the day that I met my wife. Congratulations, so. man. Yeah. That's awesome. So the other thing I know is obviously you travel all over the world. You have some amazing pictures on your site. So obviously you got, you have. Oh yeah. Love freedom to travel. travel. I traveled. God, in 2019, I did to travel 80,000 miles. So that is crazy. This year, I've traveled like, you know, six. Um, so obviously, you built the dream lifestyle that a lot of us are seeking, where you can get to do all these cool things. You have the freedom to do whatever. You, you built your businesses. So at what point did you wake up and then you say, you know what? I want to help other people. Was it like me where people just kept asking you for help and you said, hmm? I I no, no. You know help. what? I, ha I have a theory that there are two types of people in this world. <clears throat> there are those that are helpful mm -hmm. and there's everyone else. Right. And the thing that de defines helpful people is twofold. One, they're always helpful. And two, they never expect anything in return. Right. And that's sort of the way that I was brought up. And uh, I can honestly say uh, I've been taken advantage of sure. more times than I can shake a stick at, but not enough that I would ever change that as a core belief will not dissuade me uh, from from doing what it is that I do. That's kind of how I got in the coaching business is I was sort of informally coaching people. And, I, and then I turned 50 uh, and I said, OK, what's this, what's the second act of uh, my life going to be? Because like I said, I never plan to retire. As long as somebody will pay me, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to take their money and I'm going to do stuff. Right. And I but I wanted to have some control over. I wanted to be location independent. Um, I didn't want to be responsible for a massive income statement and balance sheet and all those things. So when I coach entrepreneurs, you know, that's on them and they know that you're going to make the decision. I'm going to help you through it, but ultimately these are your decisions. I'm not going to tell you what you do. I don't give you advice. I share my experiences. That's the gestalt that I follow and we'll chop it up and we'll figure it out. And yes, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. 
And I think I think everybody needs a mentor. Like, yeah, you know, I talk about it on, on here all the time. Like, listen, like I made a lot of mistakes with everything that I've done. I learned from those mistakes. But when I got to a point where I could afford it, I I seeked out the best people that I knew in the industry that I'm at to get mentorship or to, you know, pay to be like, all right, I need you to take me to the next level, like show me the ropes. And it was the same thing. A lot of people think that when you hire uh, a coach or uh, if you're lucky enough to get under a mentor, which is not easy if you're if you're going for that high end stuff, you know, uh, that they're going to solve everything for you or give you the secret per se. Like here's there, the golden ticket. There's, it's no not, there's no secrets. That's what I tell people. I'm like, dude, there's no secrets. Like everybody's a little bit different. It's just, you know, when I is actually a lot different, there's no magic formula and there's no one size fits all one size fits many. You know, I coach, I call myself a bespoke coach, which means I got to get into your head. I have to adapt to you. That's one of my superpowers is the ability to adapt to you. If you're nerdy, I'm nerdy, right? I am because a large part of me is large, right. uh, uh, but I can also be an extrovert. No problem. Uh, and that's not that's not to say that I'm being a chameleon and I'm purposely trying to morph myself um, to ingratiate myself with you. But you know, I have a I have a enormously wide range of interests. Again, much of it's on the right side and much of it's on the left side. And I I know enough in my six plus decades on the planet how to manage all that. Um, but what I find is is um, there's an enormous amount of resistance that goes on to people when you're coaching them, right? Uh, usually it takes it. Usually you get about six months into it, and you'll hit. You'll start to hit massive resistance because there's a tendency, like a like a rubber band that wants to spring back to its original shape. You're going to be stretched in a coaching relationship, and it's going to hurt a little bit, and you're going to be screaming inside your head to go back to doing things the way you were doing even though you know on a cognitive level that it wasn't working. Otherwise, why would you have bothered to talk to the coach in the first place if everything was kumbaya? Right. right. And that is tough, tough, tough to overcome. So that's like the number one note that I give people is you need to be mindful of that because as they say in the 12-step program, nothing changes if nothing changes, right? Just keep doing it the same way and nothing's going to change. Yeah, well, what's the, uh, that's, the Einstein, of- that's the Einsteinian uh, definition of insanity, which I believe is actually incorrect. And, and far be it for me to correct Einstein. He said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Right, right, right. Yes. But that's patently untrue. How right? so? Because that's a, that's a, a egotistical, um, you're the center of the world view of it. The that's world true. changes. That is true. Yeah, that is true. That's a good point. Yeah. So you you may be right in doing things over and over and over and over again. And again, we're this is not exactly what, what we're talking about. Um, they're talking about people who bat their head against the wall and expect it to not one day not be painful. That's very different than being an entrepreneur and saying, you know, I'm on to something, but the world's not ready for me. So, but I'm going to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And then what happens? One day, the world pivots. Right. I mean, look yeah. at look at what happened with Zoom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I've been doing my coaching for 10 years remotely. I've been yeah. on podcasts where people said, was it a tough adjustment um, uh, when the pandemic came? I said it was an absolute non-event. Yeah. Didn't change anything. I've been coaching people in Sydney, Tokyo, you know, Berlin, everywhere. Didn't change a scintilla for me. Yet I- Zoom all of a sudden. You know, they were this kind of sleepy little company. They were fighting against a whole bunch of things. And all of a sudden, the world changed and the stock went parabolic. And they all yeah. became gazillionaires through n- n- no doing of their own. Right. I joke, around, I joke around all the time. I'm like, oh, man, the normies found Zoom. Like, Because no, now it's not just a phone call. Everybody wants to get in Zoom. I'm like, guys, can we just phone? Can we just do the phone? Like, do we really need to be on video and all this, this whole nine yards? It's like, let's just get on the phone real quick. Like, you know, I'm with you. All these old people started saying to me, Henry, what's this zoom thing people are talking about? <laughs> like, come on, don't be such a Luddite. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm with you. It's like, um, you know, I tell my kids, don't text me. Just pick up the phone and call me old school. I want to hear um, your voice. I'm 50 50 in that one. I like texting, but at a certain point, I'm like, okay, let's get on the phone. Look, if you're going to, if, if you, if you're, <laughs> if you're um, sending a note to your wife to say, hey, pick up milk on the way home, 
That's one thing. Sure. I don't need to have a phone call for that. So yeah, right. I'm with you there. But if you're trying to split the atom, uh, maybe you want to pick up the phone. <laughs> talk about That's so funny. Uh, so <laughs> we're about to run out of time. So I want to get to this, but oh, yeah. cool. so the people that, want, that, are, that are looking for, for help or want to take their business to the next level, who's the, who's the perfect, uh, you know, student for the type of advice that you offer that you can work with, uh, because obviously not everybody's the same. I mean, no. so can you give us a little bit of a, an example of the type of person that, that works the best yeah. with your program? Yeah. yeah the avatar, yeah. uh, the, the, um, sort of name rank and serial number would be anyone, you know, pretty much 25 to 55, um, has been in business. I do, I'm working with a startup now, but that's, that's pretty rare because I charge money for what I do. Right. Um, of course you got to have, you know, you got to have the cash flow, um, in order to pay me it's just as simple as that. So I like, I like, uh, companies that have been in business at least a year or two. Um, I prefer million dollar plus businesses, you know, top line, but only uh, about 4% of all businesses in this country, and there are 30 million businesses in the U.S., ever do a million dollars in a single year. It's I believe pretty that. Rare. It's pretty rarefied air. But if you're doing a SaaS business or an FBA or, or any one of these other millions of internet-y type businesses, I've, I've had guys who only have a couple hundred thousand dollar top line, but their margins are insane. You know, Their cost of goods are min minuscule, so they can afford to pay me. Um, the number one thing is you got to you have to be coachable. Yeah, doesn't mean you have to be a doormat. Doesn't mean you can't give pushback. Perfectly normal to give pushback, but you're going to have to achieve a level of vulnerability that you may never have attempted before in your life, and that can be terrifying. You're going to have to look yourself in the mirror, and say, you know what, I don't have all the answers. All the great successful people, whether it's Gates or Elon Musk or Bezos or whatever, surrounded themselves with smart people. Gates even said, uh, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, right? Yeah, I don't smarter, even think Smarter I... is a relative term. Sure. It could, it could be somebody who, I mean, I know people who are you know super smart in one discipline and as dumb as a box of hair and a whole bunch of other. Oh, things. that's me. I'm, I'm super <laughs> smart in certain things, and there's certain things where I just it doesn't click for me. And, and I admit that. I'm like, you know what? I have somebody who takes care of that for me because I right. know I'm not the because best. Everything that doesn't click, you can hire somebody to do that. Right? Absolutely. You don't like to do this, or it doesn't float your boat. You have to ask yourself though, what do you want to be? Do you want to be that that um, you know uh, down in the weeds entrepreneur? or you want to achieve a level of the visionary role. I talk to people about obsoleting themselves from the business. And there's an old parable about, you know, what would happen if you left your business for a month and never called in? What would it look like when you came back in the door? You know, that's the entrepreneurial wet dream. Right. Well, you know what? Some people don't want that because so much, that. because so much of their self-worth is invested in the, the process. Mm -hmm. the, the purpose. Somebody sent me a Slack me a, an article talking about successful entrepreneurs. And I talk about how uh, I have a thing on my website, which is, um, um, you know, five reasons small businesses fail. And, and number five is confusing passion with commitment because passion will fade. Anybody who's been married more than maybe nine months <laughs> can expect <laughs> that passion can sometimes recede, right? Especially when, when the little ones come along. Hard to find passion. But you're committed to the relationship. You have to be. And yeah. you have to be committed to the business because there are days where it's going to suck. Oh, like, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I opened my business practice up for three months to any and all back in April, April, May, and June during the, during the height of the COVID. And I had almost a hundred phone calls with all sorts of different people. I just said, just come and I'll talk and I'm not going to charge anybody anything. I That's mean, really cool. that was a black swan event if there ever was one and people were terrified. And the first yeah. thing I asked everybody was if this lasts till the end of 2021, are you going to be okay financially? And almost universally people said, yeah, it may be tough, but I'll, I'll be able to, to get through. I can't speak for my employees, but I'll, you know, by hook or by crook, I'll be able to get through if this thing lasts two years, which is what I was expecting it to last based on 1918. 
right? Mm -hmm. hundred years ago, the year my father was born, 1918, that pandemic lasted two years. Well, I don't care about modern medicine. It's still going to take two years. It just, right. It's just how this stuff works. Um, so those are some of the, those are some of the key things. Be coachable, be mindful, understand that you're going to go places that you may not want to go and recognize the fact that the person you're working with, whether it's me or any other coach, I have another thing that's on my website, which is the 10 questions you should ask when hiring a coach. I had a year's worth of formal coach training. One of the things we talk about is judgment-free awareness. I'm not here to judge you. Right. I got no skin in the game here. I've had clients who've asked me to invest in their business. It's like uh, that changes the relationship. I don't want to do that. That's not what I do. Right. My my sole investment is for you to kick ass. Right. Whatever it is you decide you want to do. If you decide you want to launch a rocket ship out of your backyard, I'm going to say, OK, that's that's fine. That's a wonderful <laughs> Jim Collins BHAG. But we may want to think about, you know, how that plume is going to destroy your neighbors and they may be unhappy with that, right? <laughs> you know, we talk about the unwinnable game. Um, I hope we, that we're, we're not building castles in the sky. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to chop it up. And you're going to come to the realization that this doesn't really make a lot of sense. But that's not, it's not for me to judge. Right. right? Is there, is there certain uh, verticals that you'd like to specialize in? Like you mentioned SaaS before, but is there any like – verticals that you like to specialize in or you just uh, or you're like me i look at business as business like i don't care if it's like a pet business is the same yeah right. to me it's always the same i mean as long as you have a good product i can break everything down and figure it out right that's There's, the way i look at it. yeah i'm writing a new book it's called it has the unlikely title of codfish and codfish this came out of a coaching session a couple of years ago and codfish stands for customer support operations development finance in, uh, infrastructure, IT, sales and marketing, human resources, what I call the seven silos. These are the seven silos that every business, if, if you're a solopreneur like me, or if you're Bezos with Amazon taking over the world, they have these seven silos. They don't have six. They don't have eight. Everything can fit into one of these silos. And I've challenged my clients to find me something that doesn't fit in. What, what are the, what are the seven silos? Codfish. Okay. C customer support. Operations, uh -huh. development, uh -huh. finance, infrastructure, sales and marketing, human resources. Yeah, of course. Right. All right. Yeah. So I use that as a framework. Um, and what I've discovered with, um, with coaching clients is if we go through those, there are probably one or two that they're really, really good at. Um, probably three that they're okay and passable at. And probably two that they suck, you know, they, they just suck at. Yeah. Just are. I mean, I don't do, I don't do like business coaching as like, you know, I coach you as, as to run your business or whatever like that. I just do the, you know, advise on the marketing side of things. But sometimes yeah. I come across things and I'm like, I look at him like, you, do you, do you realize how fucking lucky you are that you even made it this far? Like, you know, <laughs> it's like, there's no profit or loss sheet. There's, there's no structure. There's no processes there, there's, there's nothing. And I'm like, how? Like the only reason you got this far is because you have something that people like. That's it. If it wasn't for that, like you'd be done. Uh, <laughs> there's, an old, there's an old saying that I've used a million times and I'll use it again. Success is a great deodorant. Right? I like so, that. <laughs> so my job is to sort of uncover all the little stinky parts of your business that you don't want to talk about. Right. Right. I don't want to fix something that ain't broke. Well, it ain't broke right now. But one day it will be. And you're going to have to deal with it. I don't know. I mean, I've had people who have come to me who run their business out of their personal bank account. And the way they look at it is, well, my bank account is positive, so I must be making money. Oh, yeah. I just went until the tax the taxman comes along. <laughs> yeah. There's something called accounts receivable, accounts payable, liabilities, yeah. you know, depreciation, all of these things. It's the one area that I really find with a lot of people that they're deficient is the finance side of things, which is one of the reasons I wrote a book about finance even though it's personal finance. Um, Got to know your numbers. You know, you just do. I'm amazed at how many people don't know their numbers. I'm like, what's your average order value? What's your LTV? What's your cost per acquisition? What's your profit margin? No exactly. idea. No what's idea. The no idea. Yeah. What's, what's the lifetime value of, of a client, right? Yeah. It's do crazy. you even know? No, I've got other clients who know that backwards and forwards, right? Yeah. But they, they don't have any idea. 
They don't know how to sell. <laughs> oh, well, sales is, sales is a tough one. But they don't. I was going to. I was going to go to development. They don't have any idea how to pivot their development efforts to anticipate what their clients are going to need because their clients are going to be pivoting too. Right. As as they age, their needs change. Until you had a baby, you had no need for diapers. Correct. Now we got or bottles or strollers. All of a sudden, you got injected into this whole, you know, consumer um, staple, consumer discretionary ecosystem that you were oblivious to. Pre Absolutely, like I'm like, what? We need this? What? What? <laughs> you know, it's like I didn't have that when I was a kid. <laughs> the know? day you throw out the baby bottles for your, you know, the last child you're gonna have, that's a great day. Oh, I don't know, man. That's going to hurt. Like, listen, for somebody that never wanted kids and I fought it for as long as I did and I finally gave in because I knew it would make my my wife happy, it changed everything for me, man. It's like I love that little guy more than anything in the world. It's a trip. It's a trip. You know, it's the greatest like, thing ever. But the next one for me will be grandkids. <laughs> <And then laughs> I'm like, can we have 10 now? No, I don't want grandkids. It's going to be great because I'm going to spoil the crap out of them. And then I'm going to hand them back to mom and dad. Yeah, that's what oh. our parents love. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's the greatest blessing ever. All right, listen, Harry, we're out of time, man. But I really, truly enjoy talking to you. I love that we talked a little bit about of like finance, business, screenplay writing. Hey, it's all about telling a story, man. That's business right there. That's how you sell your product. Like I said, I got a lot of interest. So we yeah, didn't talk so. about baseball cards. I've talked about baseball cards on the. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that one for the next one. Yeah, I have to leave that for the next one. Yeah, but uh, you know, anybody that that's that's looking for help in their business and they're at a point where it can they're you know they need to take it to the next level. Basically, that's what I tell people. Yeah. You need to take it to the next next level. You need a little bit of guidance. And sure, there are no secrets, but guidance for you know take it from people like me and him who have done it. Uh, and we still ask questions. Yeah, you know, I still have to do research on things, but it's good to have somebody to talk to and let it all out. That's somebody who understands what you're going through. And that's what, what it's all about, for, you know, for having that relationship. I have one my mentor as well. So I get, you know, still to this day, I have my mentor, you know, it's, you, should. you know, do it for me. But as far as like getting it done, but it's, it's great to have somebody that understands you and has been there and done it before in your vertical. So yep. uh, if you're looking for that type of help, um, check out uh, Henry's uh, website, henrydoss.com. Uh, where else can people find you? LinkedIn? Well, you can go to henrydoss.com and that'll find links to like all sorts of different stuff, but you can also go to Das Knowledge, D-A-A-S Knowledge. That's like my main my main site. You can find me on LinkedIn. Just look up Henry Doss. Um, you can find me on Facebook, although I'm not there all that often. Um, yeah. You yeah, know, we'll put, I'll put the I'll links in the description. The I, I sent you my, my standard little sheet. You can download my book for free uh, on my website. You can download those PDFs. You can take a money mindset quiz. There's, there's a lot of stuff. Cool, uh, cool. Check it out. All right. I'll put all the links in the description, guys. If you want to check it out, if you want to reach out to Henry, check out the links in the description. And Henry, thank you so much for coming on, man. I, I oh, really for having me. It. It, was, it was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. until next time. Until next time. We're good.